So we are in 1 Peter. That's where I'm taking you back today. And we are still going to talk about this word we began discussing the other day. Kata prog prognosin, according to foreknowledge of Theo Patros. And this was our key in Hagi Hagiasmo. I believe, yes. Numatos. Numatos. And I want to add two words here. It's part of our sentence structure. Ice. Hupa koi. That is, should look like that. All right. Now, the tedious task last week of giving you so much chapter and verse. You know, after a while, you don't need to do chapter and verse. You start quoting passages. But when we're talking about doctrine, it's imperative, like last week, I, I probably stood here for an hour saying chapter and verse, this verse, that chapter, this, this, that, so that you can go and reference it. Because if you can't go see it for yourself after I've opened it up, we have a problem. So. Of course, as I put it on the board, 1 Peter, and this is part of verse 2, we'll put B, and so kata, according, and the brackets, because this is adding to this, according to, for, knowledge, theu, of God, brackets, I'm adding the Father, and this is what I want us to look at in, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. Your King James says sanctification, but I'm at first going to put in separating. And there's a reason why. I'll come back to this sanctification concept of spirit, and it's okay to add the in brackets as long as I'm showing you where I'm adding it. And we'll get to this a little bit later as I speak. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard and read so many different ideas on what sanctification means. I began in the last week or two telling you about really who foremost propagated and planted ideas uh, that led to a whole wave of doctrines flowing into the Protestant stream, which are quite erroneous. They may have started off with a good focus, but they went really the wrong way. Uh, I've been talking to you about the Wesleyan view, which is very important. There are several views, Wesleyan, if that's correct at all, and we'll put up here Reformed. There's the Reformed view, Wesleyan view, the, you're going to like this, the Pentecostal. I really want to abbreviate this. <laughs> but for the sake of whatever. So we have here one, yeah, I know. I feel the same way too. Reformed. The should actually be spelled differently, I think, but Keswick, number four, number five, the Augustinian dispensationalist uh, view, actually number six, which is a splinter perhaps off of that, but really holds its own weight, is Martin Luther and the Reformation, not Reformed, which is six. And then perhaps what we may end up with, number seven, which, which we, may be in part a better understanding from all of these streams of what it means to us in the now. Now, let's start here for a minute, and I want to talk about Mr. Wesley's uh, interpretation of Scripture, which I must say, lest anybody think that I am... Uh, lift it up somehow, and I think, well, this person was a peon. He didn't know anything. He was a brilliant scholar. Brilliant scholar. 
and knew, by the way, he knew Greek very well. So we asked the question, in analyzing his doctrine of sanctification, how did it lead people to believe that holiness could be achieved in the now, and that holiness basically is being defined as being able to lead a life free of willful sin, that entire sanctification of a person is possible. You're going to say, when I'm done, you're going to say, I know why you took the time to lead me through all of these, because ultimately and fundamentally at the core of all these probably was the need to have a more fulfilled and deeper life in Christ. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. The Keswick Convention uh, that started, that's number four that I put up there, that started about 1875 in Britain, its whole driving force was a deeper life experience. Four and five day seminars telling people how to be victorious in their Christian walk. Just that the approach, perhaps for me, becomes a little bit like a mechanical box checking. And ultimately, it seems that between doctrines, if you look at the Wesleyan view of sanctification, what, what I've just said, separating or sanctification, it is essentially the goal or the chief end to bring and renew men's and women's hearts into the image of God-likeness. And that's not a bad thing because Romans declares we are being conformed and transformed. The problem is the getting there and the idea that has been perpetuated, still that is preached today, how people can live a seemingly perfect and holy life. So, let me explain this, and if it seems long, indulge me. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be brief because that'd be a lie. All right. So, in this stream of the uh, concept of sanctification, certain scriptures, Mr. Wesley saw certain scriptures that he believed were the promises of God. He believed them, believed them to be promises of God that promised people from the Old Testament, promised them a completed, sanctified life in the now. As he traveled into the New Testament, and I took a long, hard look. I'm, if I'm going to bring you information, I'm going to study all of these things to, to bring forth as much as I can to give you not only food for thought, but then to rightly divide the word. The scriptures that were used from the Wesleyan tradition began a stream of perfectionism. And I'll give you an idea of one of the scriptures that is at the, at the battleground of interpretation. Uh, in fact, let's turn there so you can see what we're dealing with. Uh, out of Matthew 5 and verse 48, and while you're turning Matthew 5, 48, this is the type of subject that the only way to come to a right conclusion is to look at how other people drew their conclusions and then to go back to the scripture and pull it apart. So in Matthew 5.48, the culmination of what Jesus is saying is, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, I asked somebody yesterday, I asked the question, and somebody who I knew would give me an erroneous answer anyway, <laughs> what the definition of perfect was and how, how to properly make a right interpretation of that because this verse, Matthew 5.48, influenced Mr. John Wesley's view of sanctification. If you read in context properly and understand the word perfect in the Greek, you can only come to one conclusion, that the word that's being used here, and I don't want to get hung up on this, but I'm trying to show you how doctrines get formed. The word being used here for perfect, which is from those root words teleos, completion, which in some places is being translated completion, mature or maturation, end or in totality. Remember when Jesus said, it is finished, the telestai. He didn't say it's perfect, although his work at the cross was perfect, but he said it is finished. So the word carries 
shades of meanings, but it never really embodies our language concept of perfect. In other words, when the King James translators translated, or when others translated from the English at that time, perfect might have been in the framework of perfected, to bring to a finished terminus, to complete something, but not as blameless without spot or wrinkle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, a whole doctrine was hinged on this verse. This is just one of a few. And if you read it in context, how could anyone draw any other conclusion? Jesus is talking about you love your neighbor. It's, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Don't the publicans do the same thing? And if you salute your brethren only, what, what more do you do? Even, even the publicans do that. Be therefore perfect. And the word being interpreted there is, we can call it, listen, God the Father is perfect and complete. But it's, it is as if to say in context of what's being said, don't show favoritism like God who is our Father and we who are His children. So forgive the term, but impartial, if you will. That's what the context sets up. It does not say be perfect, because we can't be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect. I have to get there first. And so far, I don't know how it looks, but uh, God's working on me, okay? So this began a doctrine. And the understanding of words in this tradition, in this view, such as perfect and perfection, such as the definition of sin. Now, these are all imperative, because see, I would take for granted that every single child of God out there knows what the definition of sin is, right? I just smiled for those of you on radio. And Mr. Wesley had a somewhat flawed, and I say this, and I don't say it with due respect, he had a flawed definition of sin because essentially for the believer, it wasn't Romans 3.23, all have sinned. It was we have the ability to not sin willfully once we have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we, we have the capacity to avoid those things which we know are sinful, and we may actually lapse periodically, but those are just mere lapses and they're to be excused never treating the condition of sin in its fullest context of missing the mark. And not just missing the mark as we're aiming for a target, but if the, if the bullseye of the target is Jesus Christ, everyone falls short. No matter how good your best is, you're going to fall short of that. So his definition of sin was somewhat lacking. And listen, you can go look me up in any textbook you would like. I've spent hours upon hours just combing over what is it that govern this concept, the definition of perfection. Now, according to the Greek New Testament, and all these are very important for our understanding of what this is going to do in our lives, how the third person of the Godhead comes to do something in us that will have some impact. And using these words like perfection, to the English speaker and hearer leads us to an erroneous conclusion that somehow after this activity of the third person of the Godhead comes to take up residence, that somehow I have a perfect nature that allows me, although I've been told that uh, by my late husband, but, uh, <laughs> but that allows me to not sin. Now here is the problem. If I just hinge part of the doctrine, and I've looked up every single scripture that's been used to hold this Wesleyan view, then ultimately what happens is I look at the main doctrine and I find where the flaw is. The main doctrine for holding this, that we sin no more, I'm not telling you I believe this, I'm telling you what Mr. Wesley believed, 
that was propagated as a doctrine so you can understand why I'm not preaching that. All right. Romans 6. Just thought I'd tell you that. In case somebody said, were you teaching that? No. Romans 6. Now I gave you an example of the use of the word perfect out of Matthew 5.48 to show you as an example of how he understood this word and the definition of the concept of sin completely, as I've read through many of the sermons and writings, very poorly interpreted. Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin? Now, every time you read dead to sin, that's going to be the license under this doctrine to say, well, we're dead to sin. We're dead to sin. Dead to sin, live any longer. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life. It doesn't say that you will, but that you should, which means you could, and it's possible to walk in newness of life. It's a possibility. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I'm reading even the italicized. Here we go. This is the doctrine. Everything is hinged on this one verse, Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Hmm. Well, a cursory reading of that would say then what are we to do because technically speaking, by so many people interpreting and following suit under this understanding of Romans 6.6 6, under this view, under the, this Mr. Wesley's view, we would have somewhat of a problem. So let me solve the problem. First of all, and do me a favor, so you can look at this with the right spectacles, make some doodlings on this. We're not, we're, we're not removing the italicized, and we're not, but I want you to circle a few things and make some notes. Knowing this, that our old man, that section, circle that, and if you have any room in your margin, write, all we that are by position in Adam, with all of our, you don't have to write this out, but it's all we who are in Adam with all of our culpability and condemnation, that represents total mankind in Adam. The next thing you could look at is, is crucified with him, literally was crucified with him. That, that I've circled there, that which was crucified with him was also judged and executed. That the body of sin might be destroyed. I've taken another area here. The whole Adam humanity as guilty creatures before God you can't take this and make this some individual license to introspectively interpret it on yourself. You will miss the whole meaning of what Paul was saying. And I'll explain why I'm going to be dogmatic about this. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That is no longer in legal bondage through judicial guilt. Now when you put that in the framework, you could simplify it and say, well, let me just go back to... Uh, Romans 5, where it talks about by one man's disobedience and leads us through one man's obedience. It's a corporate picture. We are just, we happen to be the recipients that are reading, but the Apostle Paul is making a corporate picture. Why this interpretation becomes important to dispel this view is number one, if the Apostle Paul was preaching that sin is destroyed in my body and in your body, then why, pray tell me, did he get to Romans 7 and say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? If in Romans 6 it's been eradicated. You see what I'm saying? It's just, you can't get to it. And this is why taking one verse and 
making it your doctrine leads people down a wrong road. The other thing is, if you really think about it, if sin were to be eradicated in our lives completely, then why would we get to, from Romans 6, are we free to sin that grace may abound, to Romans 7, who will deliver me, the I want to do but I don't do, and I do what I don't want to do, oh wretched man that I am, to Romans 8, there is therefore now no ultimate condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Well, it's self-evident to me that if you were, Romans 6, if you didn't sin anymore, why would you need to be told that there's no more ultimate condemnation? All right, we'll come back to that. So, what I'm saying is that this view, although it has many great thoughts and attributes attached to it, leads people to an idea somehow that living a sin-free life is possible in the now. All of this from one small concept that I've pulled out of 1 Peter, and by the way, you'll find that this is used out of context by so many, so we're going to figure out what on earth does it mean. The reform view, I may not get to all of these, but the reform view teaches a little bit softer, a little softer doctrine by the gracious operation of the Holy Spirit, bringing men and women the chief end to glorify God. Uh, but as you navigate through this reform view, something terrible happens. In this view, it's a co-op between man and God. It's a co-op. I do a little bit, and he does a little bit. And I do a little bit, and he does a little bit. I'm doing a dance, all right? Now, the reason why I can't hold to that doctrine, except to, to make one little exception, what man is required to do, faith. But if my sanctification is a joint work, then that means I can accomplish 50% of it without God. Hallelujah, I'm good, right? I can do 50% of it without Him. Hmm, don't think so. Now, why I highlight this. Uh, we can talk about, and I can give you chapter and verse, but I'd, more, I'd prefer more to say if any of you watched the festival where I taught all the verbs all the verbs that stream from this word, this is a noun, but all the verbs that stream from this source are either in the active voice in the Greek or in the passive. You're going to hate me after this, but I'm, I'm just busting up everybody's doctrines, and I just when I'm done, there'll be people say, <laughs> So, why this is not a co-op? Except, as I said, if you want to hinge on there, that man must have faith, we must, we must faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Other than that, the reason why it cannot be a co-op, cooperative work, is that when you look at all the verbs that occur from this root of hagiasmo, which is our translation of sanctification, they're broken into two categories, either in the active voice in the Greek or in the passive voice. In the active voice, Everything that is being done is being done by God in the active voice. The active voice, for those that didn't hear that festival in the Greek, is the actor is doing the action. Passive voice, I stand still and I receive something, but I didn't do anything to receive it. In fact, let me start over because I know there's people that didn't see the festival. The Greek language has many wonderful attributes the precision that we have with the Greek that we don't have with the English. For example, what is called voices. No, not the ones you hear in your head, but the ones that bring out uh, effectively what looks like conjugation. Voices. There are three voices in the Greek, active, middle, and passive. In the active voice, I am walking over here to pick up a piece of paper. In the middle voice, I am walking over here to pick up a piece of paper for myself. It's not for you, it's for me. I did it for me. And in the passive voice, I was standing here and somebody 
may have placed this paper in front of me, but I was standing here and didn't do anything to receive it, except it is received. No action on my part. Those are the voices. And some grammarians are going to say, I hate you because you just, you, that's too simple. Well, I'm trying to make it so everyone can participate here. So anything that's in the active from this verb, hagiasmo, that's a noun, but the verb form of that is in the active, which means God is doing all the activity. Every time a word for hagiazo, hagiasmo, or whatever it is, though, occurs, and it's in the active voice, it is God that is performing the action, and we are the recipients receiving his action passively. Okay, that's why, <laughs> that's why it cannot be a co-op, because if there's any activity, is my faith, but I'm not appropriating I am not going to try and tell you, as some of these doctrines propound and profess, that you can make yourself holy. The Reformed view says if you will get sin under control, it will produce a right behavior, and you will in turn start acting right and doing right, and ultimately the culmination of that in their doctrine, Reformed doctrine, is the imitation of Christ. Please don't try that at home. Not recommended. So, what is being said then through this view? Oh, I could do something with that. All right. What is being said? Well, let me just say this. One good thing in the Pentecostal view as held by the Assemblies of God, which is they did in verbiage abandon the concept of entire sanctification, that a person can lead a perfect and uh, sinless life, but they still use, they still use the term entire sanctification to represent what the life of the believer is. And separate and distinct in this doctrine is also sanctification, filling of the Holy Spirit, baptism, etc. We could have a lot of fun with that. But my main point is to focus and stay focused, Scott, on sanctification through this view, which basically, as according to the Assemblies of God, a simultaneous happening at the moment that a person faiths in Jesus Christ, at the moment that they are faithing in Him, the first experience of the faith, sanctification occurs. Now, according to this doctrine as well, and you're probably saying, well, what is sanctification then? You're telling me about the doctrines. Well, I've got to tell you what all these people believe because this person over here tells me I can be perfect and that I may sin periodically, but it won't be willfully. Over here, I have to cooperate with God. It's a 50-50 deal. Over here, at least I'm not told that I'm going to be perfect. This doctrine holds to the fact that sanctification is not entire, as in, now you're perfect. However, it does hold to the idea that we will be able to overcome sin in our life. If you move down to this doctrine, and you'll find this was originally a convention, conference type get together about in the 1875s, I said, in Britain, formed with the idea primarily to give hope to backslidden Christians of how to live a deeper and closer life with Christ, which, by the way, became a whole other movement. It became some camp meeting association of national nutbags that gathered to do crazy things in the woods. <laughs> yes, you heard it from me, and I just thought I'd tell you. But they would have four- and five-day seminars, and the whole the beginning of which, the first day, this is how a seminar would go. The conferences would go like this. Hundreds of people from all over the world would come. First day is to tell you about the sin in your life. There's nothing like, you know, if you're going to push somebody off of a cliff, you might as well just get it off to a good start. Instead of telling people about the depravity of mankind and how we're all basically in this together because of Adam and Eve, and that the state that I'm in 
oh, I believe in free will and I believe I've made some bad choices in my life, but the first thing to do day one is to tell you about your sin and make sure you know about your sin so that you can essentially confess your sin and move on. Day two, I mean, there's a whole, uh, I got a whole outline here. Want to know the whole, you want to know the whole deal? You can have a whole uh, holy ghost hoedown. Uh, day two, victorious Christian living. Day three is consecration. Day four is life in the spirit. And day five is pressure, preparation for service. And then, virus con Dios. Now, let me ask you a question. How can, uh, listen, how can five days solve the problems of a lifetime? It's like one hour of church can't solve the problems that you and I have made and created. It's just, that's, those are sitcoms, by the way. 30 minutes, at beginning to end. This is your life. It took you 30, 40, 50 years to bleep it up. Don't expect to fix it in an hour, right? Or even five days. I mean, listen, I have to just say it the way it is for us to at least keep a perspective that somehow this word, in hagiasmo, has to it an initial inception. When I began to faith, something, and I do believe, a simultaneous happening with my faith that turned on a darkened part of my being. And I do believe that for the rest of my life, it is a progressive walk and successive waves of ups and downs resulting in this. As long as I am keeping the faith and faithing, I'm connected with Christ. I am in union with him. I'm joined heir with him as long as I'm connected in the faith. And I'd have to say this process of being separated from, to, has its application in my personal life, and the deposit of God's nature, his Holy Spirit, as distinct from other uh, entities or spirits, deposited in me, enabling me at first blush to do something that, believe it or not, is spelt out in my verse out of First Peter. See, there's many things that happen when the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us at our, if you want to call it, the beginning of our faith. And one of the things that happens, the Spirit of God deposited in us, that's why I give you the grammar and I say this is dative, it's implanted life, God's life in me. But I want you to look at this, ice hupakoin. This is what this will produce resulting in ice. Ice is a small little preposition in the accusative, and you grammarians go look it up. If you say, well, how could that mean all of that? Trust me, it does. Resulting in or producing. Resulting in or producing obedience, not perfection. I read that, and I thought, you know, that's pretty simple. That's just one dimension of God's nature taking up in us, obedience. In fact, the Coptic translation of this verse does something really interesting that the Greek doesn't do. It continues and says, obedience of, obedience of pistis, of faith. That's the Coptic. Actually, it's of faith. The Greek doesn't do that, but the essence is there. And essentially, I'd say when people say, well, does that mean then that we're able to be obedient and therefore apply these principles in our life and do and walk and be? No. It simply means the capacity for obedience, resulting in or producing obedience to something is the end result. And I'm sorry to say this, as much as I've looked and chewed around every single example you're going to find this is only one dimension of sanctification being spoken of here. One dimension that produces or results in obedience, and obedience not just to be obedient like sit, stand, walk, not like that. I can teach a dog, and you can teach your pets to do that. Obedience to the voice of the sayer. My sheep know my voice. Obedience to that respect 
in an understanding that God has given His word of instruction. Now, oh, all of that? Yeah, and guess what? Somewhere else you're going to find out something really interesting. Can I, can I indulge you? You're going to find something really interesting. This wonderful deposit of God's life by His Spirit in us that produces or results in obedience. And if you look at your last part of that verse, it says sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There will be a recognition of the finished work of Jesus Christ in the believer's life that is no longer trying to do the uh, work and cleansing part that Jesus did already. It, it clears up and dispels so many of these ideas that somehow we cooperate, we do something, except we fail. Now, the marvel of this is as I began to study this as a concept, I went through Scripture to find, well, what else are we told that the Holy Spirit does as part of the sanctifying or separating process. Now you'll understand why here I use the word separating because we're being separated from, from our former way, from our former thinking to the obedience that we will ultimately find in Christ, His finished work at the cross. As I was reading this, I found another dimension very clear about sanctification, which is these doctrines that lead us down another road. How many have ever read this? That we weren't called to impurity or to iniquity, but to cleanliness or to holiness. And you read that and you go, huh? I mean, let's be honest here, because I read that many times and I thought, well, but how, how is that accomplished and by what means? And as I was reading that, something dawned on me a term I've used for you many times and for me, Holy Spirit's work also does something else. Let me write it in English. Letters. Catharizo. Remember I said there's a word that sounds like a catheter word? Right? It sounds like a catheter word, catharizo? All right. Somewhere else we're going to study this concept and find that when God sends his spirit into a believer, there is a process of catharizing the heart. And that brought me back to something that dispelled this doctrine completely. You see, part of John Wesley's doctrine, not only did he have a definition of sin that was erroneous, but he didn't understand the law. And part of his teaching was that we are commanded to keep the law which is fulfilled now in the Ten Commandments, which he calls the royal law, which every Christian must keep and live. And I read that and I said, well, I, I can't do that. I don't even want to. <laughs> but that forced me back to look at some of, what, some of the things that Jesus said. And Jesus says something very staggering when he says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I went back to this passage and I said, oh my, it's not a law. Jesus is giving an instruction of some sorts. Blessed are those poor in spirit, they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, they shall be filled. And blessed, blessed, are the pure in heart, for none of us are pure in heart, but by the process that God gives us His Spirit, placing a measure of Him in us, that eventually, we'll study this, begins to catheterize our hearts when the work is done. When the work is done, not now, when the work is done. Blessed are those catheterized and catheterized by the Holy Spirit, the sanctification process, they shall see God as an end, final completion. Sermon on the Mount is not speaking of those who can be pure now because no one can be pure now. That got me to thinking that this is all preparation for eternity. And the very thing I said to you last week about being tethered in time and tethered to eternity simultaneously is what's happening. You cannot live, I'm sorry, 
If you stick around and listen to God's word long enough, something inside you is going to change, but not because I told you to and not because you want to, but because God's word contains the power that is the power of salvation. And that reality check that God has given us one to come alongside and literally come in to bring us to obedience, resulting or producing. It doesn't say you're going to be obedient in the now, but producing or resulting in obedience. That eventually, I could go on and tell you different dimensions. This is just one. That God will cleanse our hearts. And it is not a now immediately. When people say, God gave me a clean and new heart. No, the psalmist prayed that. Prayed that. Jeremiah prayed that. David prayed that. In Psalm 51, create in me a new heart. But if you read the rest of the psalm, he said, wash me, cleanse me, purge me. He was speaking something we don't even apprehend of God's power placed in us. So when folks talk about sanctification, don't get all huffy and uptight about worrying about what they think. I'm telling you, the dimensions of God, which we cannot put in a box, but the dimensions of God's power actively working in our life produce or result in obedience to Christ. And ultimately, there has to be a cleansing power, but it's not because I tell you to be clean. It's not because you desire to be clean. In fact, the more you desire to be a cleaner vessel, you're going to find something, the more dirty you become. Oh, I hate you. Let's just be honest here for a minute. I'm curious to know how many who came from outside, they came from outside of the church world and thought you were doing okay. You might be like me and I thought I was doing okay. Now, the closer I'm walking to God, the more I press into his word, the more I see how dirty I am. Is that anybody in this room? Well then, take comfort. God's doing a marvelous work inside of you that nobody can come alongside and say, live perfectly. Don't live in sin and don't do that. Now, but pastor, what about what Jesus said to the man and to the woman? Go and sin no more. Did he mean it? Would you like to know? Yes, I thought you would. <laughs> I'll surprise you. There's only one real reference. And again, if you're a scholar, if you have the means, please check me out. I'm no longer in the mood to give a defense for what I believe. I have documentation to back it up. John 8, the woman taken in adultery, for which I have, uh, I, t I did a teaching on it a few years back, and in my careful study of the scriptures recognized that that was a later edition glossed in and is not part of John's original text. Now, does that mean we should throw it out? No, but I'm just telling you, it wasn't in the original. It was tacked in there later, shoehorned in there later. Go and check me out. So there's only one reference. And that's in John 5. So this is for my brothers and sisters in Tennessee who said, well, what, what are you going to do about that? And I'm sure they weren't meaning it in disrespect, but I'm going to tell you. The passage where Jesus in John 5 says, go and sin no more, is regarding a man. Would you like to turn that with me? Well, let's, let's do this together. So we can finally put it to rest that when Jesus says a certain thing, he really means it. A right reading of it will clarify a lot of the interesting theology that is uh, considered. <clears throat> Remember, I take Jesus as my final authority, so if he says something, it's going to make me look twice. Okay, here we go. John 5. And you know this was the story of the man uh, laying by the pool where the angel would come down a certain season to trouble the water. And Whosoever then first, verse 4, appearing after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years, 38 years, when Jesus saw him lie and knew, Jesus knew that he had been now a long time, italicized in that case, in that way, he said unto him, Jesus said to the man, Will you be made whole? Do you want to be well? Now, if Jesus were speaking to me and I was in that place for 38 years, I would have said, Master, Lord, do it now. I can't wait anymore. 38 years, yes. Right? Listen to what the man says. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. 
while I'm coming, another one steps down before me. 38 years I've been sick. I'm still waiting for someone to come pick me up and put me in the water. Jesus, can you take me to the water? <laughs> Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. At Jesus' word, it's very reminiscent of the passage of where they fished all night and Jesus said, No, put your net, your net out again. Well, Jesus, we've been out here a whole night, but nevertheless, it's your word. They put out the net, and here comes the net so filled with fish because at his word, the obedience to his word, Jesus says to the man, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. The same day was the Sabbath. Oh, oh, the Jews therefore said unto him that was, he was cured. It's the Sabbath day. You know, Jesus... Could you wait another 24 hours to heal the man? Maybe come back here. We know you're busy, but could you come back in 24 hours when the Sabbath is over? <sighs> it's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. <laughs> Forget about healing the man. You just can't carry your stuff around. That's law-breaking. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up, he told me. The one that, that told me, you know, he, he's the one. He's the one that said it. He's guilty. He's, he's responsible. He said, take up your bed. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And of course, we know it's Jesus. And all the multitude began to gather around. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, that same man, and said unto him, behold, thou art made, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed, told the Jews it was Jesus that had made him whole, etc. There's a lesson when Jesus says, sin no more. What was the man's problem? He was waiting for somebody. He had no faith. He had absolutely no faith that he could be healed, that he could be the first one in and healed. He had no faith. Jesus' instruction to the man to sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee is man have faith now, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Sin no more. It's in that framework that he's talking to the man. Not, and listen, let's be clear. The man was sick for 38 years. That'd be saying he was sick because he sinned, and Jesus addresses that somewhere else. Not so, not so, not so, not so. And anybody who says so is wrong. You don't get sick because you sin. That's another denomination that teaches that. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Just put that in your pocket right there and think, this wasn't a man who had committed a sin except that he had no faith. Now, I'm going to rest my case on John 5, but I'd add up to John 8 and say, if there's one thing to be said, Jesus is saying, now, walk the life of faith. If there's something he calls the woman daughter, go and sin no more. The need to go back like a pig or a dog going back to its vomit, no more. But walk by faith now. I've restored you. I've put you in place. It's a life of faith. And God clearly spells out, at least for me, very clearly, that there is not a possibility while we yet breathe until we are completely standing in his presence over there to have the ability for sin, the condition or the act, removed. Now, somebody might say, well, I like it better if you tell us that we can overcome and we don't have to be slaves and servants. Well, you don't. That's the beauty of Romans 6. Romans 6, Paul says, you decide which master you're going to serve. You will serve somebody, like that song they sing, you will serve somebody. You do have a choice in which master you're going to serve. And if you choose to serve the master of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, by his spirit being with you, it, it, there's not a guarantee in my life that now I will not sin or I'm not going to fall off the wagon, but I've got someone to guide me. What do the scriptures mean to you and to me? There is no temptation known to man such as common to man. What, is, what does that mean, that if that's put in there and included for me, that things are not going to be put in my face. And the tempter comes to tempt us, and we are tried and buffeted all the day long. But thanks be to God, he gave us a gift of his nature, implanted life 
in us that eventually, it may not be in the now, but the end product or resulting in producing obedience, that said obedience is not just some random occurrence. He gives us this gift inside of our being to cleanse us, and the cleansing is lifelong, and by the way, may never be seen by you. Someone will say, well, she doesn't look very holy to me. Who are you to judge another man? Only God who searches, the scripture says, the reins, our innermost being. And I'm sorry, but if we were to have a position where someone could say, well, I'm able to stand, the scripture out of John says, whoever says they have no sin is a liar. Now, whatsoever is born of the Spirit, and I'd say who and what, as God's nature placed in us, cannot sin. But the nature that still resides, which is me, Paul, Romans 7, wretched man that I am, is still duking it out. Now, is there hope? Absolutely. It's the hope that gave, for at least for me, the, the ability to look on this concept of sanctification and say, first of all, it's not so scary. Second of all, God is doing a work in me, and I'm sorry, it's not a second definite and a third definite and a fourth definite. God is pretty smart. He knows how to take us right where we are, and he uses us right where we are. And he doesn't say, I've got to go and make some ad adjustments with you. Uh, I will just keep washing you here and keep doing it and just, you know. Now, if God is God, let's go back to my cranium. Something in here, if you think about this, and I'm not, <clears throat> uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, and this is not my specialty, but something just superficially tells me that what goes on in here, in my brain, by nature of the way I am created, and the way you are created, we do not have the ability to switch on a gear that makes us to walk a certain way, we can fake something. I'm sure we live in Hollywood, so why not? You can fake everything in Hollywood. But as a lifelong change, let me be clear on what I'm saying. If God is God, then I don't need to try and fake some emotional con job on you brothers and sisters to try and show you and display my holiness. God's doing it in me and in you. And what to one person may seem like, well, you don't act and look like other people. To God, looks perfectly normal. Read Watchman Nee's simple writing and what he wrote about the normal Christian, which didn't seem normal at all for the rest of the world and still today holds true. Now you tell me, just as a sidebar, if God, who is able, and I say if, but I know the answer, he is. But if God is able, to place his nature in me, and to turn me. Remember, my first frame of reference in hearing the gospel is the first message, repent. Not, not uh, bawling and squalling and mea culpas and mea maxima culpas. Metanoia, with the mind. If my first act is to change my mind, it's needless to say that this mind will not stay changed and fixed unless there is a directive helper helping me, guiding me, leading me in truth, in light, in life, helpless without the comforter. And you know how I know there's little subtle nuances in the scripture. You know that God has left abundant clues for us. Jesus chose 12 men. These 12 walked with him. One of them betrayed him, one of them denied him. And the close of Luke's gospel has an interesting, uh, not right at the end, but towards the end of the gospel, about chapter 24, has an interesting thing, that after these many years of walking with the Lord, it says that he opened up their understanding of the scriptures. Remember, he had been talking and quoting and telling and saying, and suddenly, right at the close, about Luke 24, you can find it in your own time, it says he opened up their understanding so that suddenly they could understand and perceive. Well, guess what? He was before he sent the comforter. He was the embodiment in the person, in the Godhead, in the flesh, embodying, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father and the deposit of the Spirit in him when he was baptized, opened up their understanding. 
Man, I could go on. Obedience, cleansing occurs in the inner man, understanding, our eyes like scales. We begin to look at the scripture. That's happened to me many times. That's the guidance given to us by the Holy Spirit, where you begin to look at scripture and you, you've read the same thing over and over again. You look at it and you say, oh my. In fact, I've told you, I've had these oh my God moments where I look at the scripture and I say, oh boy. So, at least initially I can say to you what sanctification is not. Sanctification is not that you'll be perfect in the now. Sanctification is not that you're not going to sin anymore. Sanctification is God's activity to his outcalled ones, which last time I checked, the ecclesia is you and me, to his outcalled ones, where he is given, according to his foreknowledge, kata prognosin of the Father, God the Father, has deposited his nature, part of his nature in us, producing or resulting in obedience. It doesn't say perfection. It doesn't say super cleanliness in the now. We know no flesh will enter into his presence. We know that it, the scripture does say, by the way, without holiness, no man can see God. So if you're not seeing what I'm saying now, God has already deposited his nature in you and working the work. Without holiness, no man shall see God simply means the person living in you and in me. And there is, I'm sorry, the activity of faith that says God's doing a work in me. By golly, it may not look like it to anybody else, but that is something I know by faith. The scripture tells me, and I've taken it to myself, God's doing a work in me now. You don't like that? Go make yourself some toast. <laughs> but I'm perfectly happy to know the outside may not look too much like other people want it to look like, but I know I have received this gift we call sanctification, which produces and results in obedience to the voice, the one speaker, the one voice moving me and you, pulling him towards him, guiding us in all things. Nothing more, nothing less. There are so many dimensions of God's nature, but this is the one I'm focusing in on, obedience. And we'll continue into this passage to look at what else we can glean, but at least I pray a little bit better handles to just take to yourself. It's not some freaky mystical event. It's a reality in our lives as fathers in Christ. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.